Good afternoon. Welcome to the Goes R preview event at NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Thank you. I'm joined here by Kyle Herring with NOAA, and today we're going to learn everything you ever want to know about the Goes R mission, which is NOAA NASA's next generation weather satellite. It's launching tomorrow at 5:42 p.m. Eastern Time, right here in Florida. In the room with us today are a group of social media followers. Uh, they're here to learn about NASA uh, and NOAA's mission, and also to um, to to ask questions of the panelists that we're going to have today. We have a whole cadre of people that are going to tell us more about the mission. Uh, if you're watching at home. Uh, feel free to use the hashtag AskGoes if you have a question, and we'll try to get to it and answer it when we, either on social media or here in the room. Uh, with that, let's get started, Kyle. Thanks, John. Um, as my colleague said, uh, this is a NOAA NASA mission, and NOAA's really excited. This is our first social we've done with NASA, so we're really excited to have you all here and work with uh, NASA on this project. So to kick it all off, we're going to have uh, Dr. Voles come up and introduce the NOAA mission. So Dr. Stephen Voltz is the head of NOAA Satellites, and he's going to talk a little about what NOAA Satellites is and what we do. So thanks, Kyle. Thanks, John. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I hope you're as excited as I am. Um, this is, uh, I will dispel one thing that John said at the start. Uh, you're not going to learn everything you need to know about GOES-R in 90 minutes. It's, it's taken 20 years to get here. It's going to take more than 90 minutes to explain it all. But but what does it mean for, for us at NOAA, and, uh, and at NESA specifically, the Satellite Information Services, is GOES-R is, is really the, it's the first of a, of a new generation of, of geostationary satellites. We've been building, with NASA's help, uh, geostationary satellites since the early 70s, uh, the GOES program. This is the first redesign from the ground up, from the start, um, in about 20 years, and maybe 40 years, when you think about the technology that's in the current satellite systems we have on, on orbit now. So what we, and, and the other part that's key about this mission, I think is a little bit different, is when you think about designing uh, geostationary observations 20, 30, 40 years ago, we were still in the threshold of learning what it is to do meteorology from space. The models were generations younger than they are now, uh, you know, Fortran computing programming, et cetera. Think about what you've done, what we've seen in the last 20 years from 1970 to 1990 to 2000. That kind of learning curve went into the design of the GOES satellite. So it's not only faster with a higher rate um, assessment of imaging of the Earth, with more channels, with more weather, with more frequency channels, so you can look at water at different levels, you can look at infrared in multiple bands, and with, uh, with red, green, and blue full color imagery, and with higher resolution. But it also is doing all of those measurements with a much stronger observing system, a much stronger numerical weather modeling prediction capability, and a much smarter clientele, both on the meteorology side, and the science and the research side, so that we know what we think we can do with all these great data that are coming down from GOES-R. So what happens within NESDIS, as the intro will tell you a little bit what NESDIS and NOAA does with this, this, we have not only the observing system in space, which is the satellite you see here, all the ground systems which have to transmit the, the multi-megabits per second data rate down to our ground stations to process. What actually will happen is the data will come from GOES, come to our ground stations, get sent to our processing system built by one of some of our, con our major uh, partners in the system, turned from these raw data into observations and products, and then retransmit it back up to the GOES satellite, and then broadcast to the whole Western Hemisphere. So GOES is not only an observing satellite, it's a broadcast, it's a major communications and broadcast satellite as well. So anybody with the right dish, with the right antenna, can downlink at the same rate and same real time the data that the, the meteorologists here in the US, the National Weather Service will use. So they'll get that same near real time imagery, the, the global lightning mapper and all the other geostationary lightning mapper, all the other measurements as well in near real time. So GOES is part of a much larger system, an integrated system of observations and capabilities. From a NESA's point of view is, we have to not only fly the satellite, uh, build and make the measurements, take the data down, integrate it, do those products and services, but then store it in our archives so that we can match those data with our low Earth orbit satellites, our archival data sets, the models that the National Weather Service uses to, to enhance the entire um, environmental information system that we are part of uh, providing for the nation. So it's really the, the shining, the sort of the, the piece de resistance, the top of a, of a very large 
cake or, or our empire of data and information, this is the new coin, the new, the new prize that we have that we're going to be bringing forward into it. Um, you're going to hear from Steve Goodman and from the instrument, instrumentalists and from the ground system folks about all those other pieces I just described. But from NESDIS, it allows us then to bring this great satellite capability with our ground systems and our modeling and our information technology to get all that together now and, and this great leap forward in terms of capabilities and science. And the last part I'll say before I turn it over, the mic over to my partner from NASA, is that the, what we're finding now that, again, what we didn't know 20 and 30 years ago is it's not just the individual measurement that counts. It's how that measurement matches up with other measurements we've taken. So we have very capable low Earth orbit imagers which have higher resolution than GOES, which have more spectral bands than GOES, which have more information on an image by image basis than GOES has. Now we have GOES, which is going to be providing with clearly almost the same timestamp with close to the same resolution and bands, frequency bands, the same information, but real time. So the combination of that LEO and GEO, the, the staring and then the higher resolution uh, band pass swipes, will allow us to do weather modeling and information in a way that we've never had before. So bringing these data together, these big data, into a way, into an integration so that we can now explore and develop the capabilities in the ways that we're not sure yet what will be the outcome. But we know it'll be more than what we've promised, always under-promise and over-perform. So we under-promised with this great satellite, but we expect to over-perform over the coming decades with all the integration. So with that, I think I turn, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Thomas Zergukin, who's the head of, the uh, of NASA's Science Mission Directorate. So Thomas? Safe. I'm really excited to uh, be here together with our partners, uh, NOAA. Uh, you know, NASA is the civilian agency that built spacecraft, and so basically uh, we're working together with NOAA. A lot of NASA people are working there together with many industrial partners to build a spacecraft as powerful as, uh, as, as GOES are. So for me, one of the things that you learn when you work at NASA, and I, I'm sure it's exactly the same way at NOAA, is, is everybody who works there knows why they work there, and they're really strong in their belief that what they're doing has an impact in every day's life. And this spacecraft is one of those tools that was put together, one of those machines that was put together by many different people. It started, of course, uh, by learning about nature. Uh, many of these programs, projects, were funded by NASA initially, uh, on the other agencies, National Science Foundation, and then it comes forward with innovators like you're going to hear about, you know, talk about like how do you, so if you learn about lightning and what happens with updrafts and so forth, how do you make an instrument that actually can do that operationally? This is the stuff that NOAA does and, you know, like we don't do at NASA at all, right? Kind of operationally every day. So that works. So it's that kind of innovation that goes into it. And then it's a big team. Uh, both at NASA and, and uh, partners that then put it together and interface with that system. See, the previous type of spacecraft, that the, the GO spacecraft up there, they were built before you had the weather in your pocket on your phone. They were built before you expected that every minute, if you wanted to, you can see where that front is right now, and you want to go observe that natural phenomenon. Well, GOES are does it delivers on that kind of thing. It's, it's really a uh, weather satellite for the next generation, the generation that we're used to being now with the internet in our pockets. And so for me, that's really exciting. Um, the other thing that I, I believe also very strongly, remember how I said how it starts with research? Um, he's talked about operation, many of you will. I want to talk about research. What will happen the moment we have these data? Amazing researchers around the world, some of them just on their own computers at home. That's possible now, right? We'll pick up those data that are public, uh, published by NOAA. Some of them are at NASA. We're going to put grants out there. And again, we'll pick up that data and learn more about making predictions, learn more about how nature works, and learn more about how we can protect lives and how we can pro provide value in society like uh, goes our will. And so that's the other thing I'm excited. So yes, we're involved in building it, but I'm also really excited to work with uh, NOAA and uh, the community overall to fund uh, science projects that really look at the next generation because we will never stop uh, as we want to go forward and, and make life better and learn uh, about nature better than uh, we, uh, we know today. So that is uh, the second point I wanted to make. And with that, I'll stop and turn it over to you. Thanks so much.
So next up, we're going to have Mike Stringer and Ed Grigsby come up. They're going to tell you a little bit about the Gozar mission, the Gozar program, and a little bit about the NOAA-NASA partnership. So Ed and Mike are from NASA and NOAA, but they both work to help manage the Gozar program. Before we do that, though, we're going to play a little video about how you actually build a weather satellite. Say you've been observing Earth's weather using GOES satellites for the past 40 years, and suddenly you realize you need to launch another satellite to keep doing it because it's really important. Naturally, you might think to yourself, great, let's just box up parts from the previous satellites, launch them into space, and let them do their thing. Unfortunately, that's just not how it works. Scientists and engineers are always looking for better ways to improve the weather forecast, and for them, images like this from decades-old satellites just aren't quite up to snuff. Thankfully, scientists and engineers have been busy working with meteorologists to improve things, so they have an idea of what data is needed next. That way, when they launch a new satellite, they're adding to what they've learned before, which means even better weather forecasts for the rest of us. So, when you build a satellite in NOAA's new GOES series, called GOES-R, it naturally sets off a flurry of activity. Because they always want to improve things, engineers might change the satellite platform, upgrade all the instruments, and, because it's meant to improve the forecast, add something totally new that's never been done before, like a new lightning mapper. After months of constructive debates, and probably more than a few late nights, they'll finally come to an agreement. Once everything's been approved, the engineers get to design and put the satellite together. However, even though they've built GO satellites before, it's not just a matter of pulling out the old designs and bolting everything together. Because there's new science to be done, things have to be redesigned, modified, upgraded, built, tested, retested, tested some more, and finally delivered, so that at the end of the day, it all fits neatly atop a giant rocket. Once all that's finished, the satellite launches into space, the scientists and engineers celebrate, and lots of new data starts coming in that improves the weather forecasts for us here on Earth. So, <laughs> so that's how you build a weather satellite. That easy, right? Um, so I'm going to have Mike and Ed come up and tell you a little bit about, uh, about the Gozar mission. Can I have my first slide, please? I'm Mike Stringer, the assistant director, uh, assistant program director for the Gozar uh, satellite series. Uh, GOES is the Geosynchronous Operational Environmental Satellites. Um, and we've been building them and flying them for uh, 41 years. So October of 1975 is when GOES-1 was first launched. And you can see from the graphic there, we've had the different GOES versions. And GOES-R series is the next generation. We are building four identical satellites, R, S, T, and U. And the one being launched tomorrow is GOES-R. Next satellite. Or next uh, <laughs> slide. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the Gozar series uh, has three times the channels. So on the current series, we have five channels. And on this series, we're going to have 16 channels. So this allows us to see the, the clouds differently and see dust and volcanic ash and be able to predict what's going on and track what's happening with that. So if you remember when there was a volcano that was erupting and they had to clear the airspace very wide to avoid that volcanic ash or any chance of it, well now we'll be able to see more detail where that ash is and hopefully be able to reduce that restricted airspace that they'd fly in. It has four times better resolution. So the resolution uh, allows us to see more clearly and see what's going on with finer detail. And then finally, it has five times the speed. So currently, it takes roughly 30 minutes to scan the full disk with the current on-orbit sensor. Well, with the new sensor, we'll be able to scan the disk in 15 minutes while also scanning the continental US every five minutes and be able to sc scan a mesoscale or roughly a thousand by thousand kilometer area as often as every 30 seconds. So now we can actually look at a, a hurricane eye or look at developing thunderstorms and watch what that's happening essentially in real time. So instead of today where the, the weather service gets the data 
you know, probably on the order of 10 to 15 minutes after it's been collected. And so right now they tell us, that's kind of telling us what happened. With goes R, it'll be what's happening now. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ed from, from NASA. Thanks, Mike. Is this mic on, Mike? Okay, I'm Ed Grigsby. I'm the <clears throat> Deputy System Program Director for GOES-R. Um, I just took that job about two months ago. I was the chief engineer for GOES-R for five years. So they came and asked me, what did NASA do to, uh, for GOES-R with their NOAA partner? Well, let me tell you. NASA has a rich history of making science vision a reality. And that's what we did for NOAA. We brought the, the brilliant engineers from Goddard and all over the uh, NASA center uh, headquarters, NASA centers, brought them together and we made Gozar what it is today and what you're gonna see launched tomorrow and what's going to save lives in the future. The program office that was built 2005, 2006 timeframe was really um, the turning point for the Gozar development because that started the implementation phase of Gozar. And what happened at that point was NASA and NOAA brought together a partnership that nobody's ever seen before. We have an integrated program. NOAA, NASA, the program management team for Gozar sitting right here. We have a program project director who is a NASA lead. We have a NOAA deputy for her. We have a NASA deputy for the ground system and a NOAA lead for that ground system development. So it's highly integrated. Every single functional area has a highly integrated NOAA NASA team. That's what made it a success. And that's what you're gonna see make Gozar successful. Thank you. Great guys. Thank you. So we're going to hang on to the Q&A. Great. So we're now going to do a short Q&A section. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, John and I will be around the sides. We'll pass out microphones. Also, if you're on social media, uh, you can use the hashtag go, ask goes, uh, and we'll try and pull some questions from Twitter as well. All right. Do we have a first question? All right. Here we go. Was there anything that was implemented early on uh, with goes R that when, when you got to 10 years after the fact, you had to then revisit and say, oh, we can do better in this, you know, in this whatever technology, for instance. I think, I think we've had a lot of lessons learned from 10 years ago. Um, I started on Gozar 2002, um, was on for a couple of years, then went to another program and then came back, always come back to Gozar. Um, and during that time frame, I think uh, some of the lessons learned were really about interfaces. Making sure, from my perspective, again, I'm a system engineer, so it all boils down to making sure all the pieces work together, right? So one of those really critical pieces is what is the data supposed to look like when it goes out to the National Weather Service? Well, we had one format, and we were marching along with that format, but during that time frame, guess what? Different formats started creeping in. So we had to, we had to kind of adjust the format of the data out. I think that was one of the, the good examples that I can give you. Uh, what kind of updates are, what you, you've updated the spacecraft to provide more data. What kind of updates had to be do, done to ground installations to support all this additional data that you're producing from the spacecraft? So for the ground system, uh, we had to do a whole new ground system because we need to be turning all this extra, you know, vast amount of data out in a near real-time fashion out to the weather service. So one of the main things that we, we did is, of course, all the processing power for that. But then also we had to build new antennas for that. And so Harris, uh, who's our prime for the ground system, built 16.4 meter antennas, three of them at Wallops and three of them at our backup at uh, uh, West Virginia, at Fairmount, West Virginia. Yes, you talked about how, how 
radar will help to revolutionize weather forecasting on Earth, but how will it help to also forecast for space, with space weather? So for space weather, we have uh, multiple instruments. We have the SUVI, which is looking at the ultraviolet images of the sun. We have EXIS, which is looking at the energy coming off the sun in X-ray irradiance. We also have magnetometers and um, SICE, which is check, uh, looking at the protons and electrons and particles that are impacting the satellite. Uh, will this satellite help in tracking climate change? You're asking some really good questions about science, and in just one second, that guy right there is going to come up, <laughs> Steve Goodman, and he's, he can answer those questions much better than Mike or I could ever. But, but in general, it'll be adding to the climate records and, and having all that, and all that data will be stored and be able to access by the climatologists. On that note, we are going to move on to Steve so we can talk about the science of it. Thanks, guys. Thanks. I'll take this one. So this is Dr. Steve Goodman. He is the senior chief scientist for Gozar. Uh, and he's going to tell you all about all the science behind Gozar. You've heard about it, why all the program. And now you're going to hear about all the amazing things it can do. In, in five minutes or less, yes, two minutes exactly. or less. <laughs> All right, so uh, rapidly go through this. So I'm going to forget my animation, so I want to start with my animation of a severe storm outbreak, which I think had about 50 severe storms, tornadoes, hailstorms, wind, and I want you to notice this is what we mean by weather as it happens. It takes only 23 seconds for us to scan one of these regional scenes, and it's just a minute or less before we get it out to the forecast. You see that line of clouds, and we know what's going to happen. When that hits developing clouds, they're going to explode because there's a convergence boundary. So you see those clouds grew. The one in the upper right had multiple tornadoes in it, and we can see cloud top features because of our four times better resolution, and there are certain features you see at the top of the cloud that are related to the intensity of the storm updraft and then are related to the likelihood of severe weather. Now imagine we combine that rapid scan imagery with the lightning mapper. So you all go outside in daylight and tell me how much lightning you can see. Well, you can't see any, but we have a really neat instrument that uh, takes 500 pictures a second from above the clouds, and it differences those uh, successive images at every pixel. And when we see a small change of light output at each pixel, and we see multiple light outputs, then we know that that's not random noise, but it's lightning. And that's how we detect lightning during the daytime. That's the challenge. And we're sending that data down at 7.7 .7 megabits per second. And then we can filter out artifacts that are in the data stream. And we can do all that in about 10 seconds. And the weather service said, well, we don't need it that fast. Uh, 20 seconds is good enough. So OK, fine. So um, we get it to them within 20 seconds. So within half a minute, you have all these beautiful structures you see from the imagery. You have the lightning, which you can't see during the daytime. We can do it at night. The astronauts have been showing us since the 60s. You can see lightning from space. But at nighttime, you can see it with your eye, but you can't see it during the day. So that's the major innovation for the lightning mapper. And you say, oh, gee, I see lightning striking the ground. Well, how do you see that from space? Well, we don't see the strike the ground that you see, but the channels from that lightning actually go up into the cloud. And that light then makes its way to cloud top and then makes a puddle of light. And that's what we see. So that's how we're able to detect lightning with high efficiency. And it doesn't matter if it's just in the cloud or if it went to ground. We see all types of lightning. And that is a new, hopefully revolutionary measurement telling us about the intensity of storms. Um, you're probably interested what happened to Hurricane Matthew recently. And I asked the Hurricane Center forecasters, I said, I'm going to be asked what might Gozar have done if it was already taking data on orbit. And one of the things that happened with Matthew was early on when it was in the Caribbean, um, it was not correctly predicted that the storm was going to uh, rapidly intensify. And the kinds of measurements we get from Gozar, the lightning gives us an indicator about changes in the eye wall of the developing uh, hurricane. And also, we're able to track the uh, clouds and the water vapor. We call those motion vectors. And that information actually goes into the global forecast model. So you say, how does Gozar help forecast as opposed to like the now casting 
in the short term, we call it, in the zero to 60 minute time period for warnings, the, the four times better resolution tells us more about the attributes of the cloud. So instead of mis, uh, assigning where the height of those motion vectors are that we're tracking, we can do that more accurately. We can reduce the speed bias that we have in the current models. And by putting it into the global forecast system, the more the regional forecast models, say for hurricane development, are embedded or nested within these larger scale models. And so that's how we're gonna help the forecasts of tropical storms. And the forecasters are telling us, if you go in this rapid scan mode that I showed you, as soon as we get daylight, that's the first indication of where that eye is and how it's changed overnight because it's hard to see in the infrared. So as soon as they get that, we're in rapid scan mode, immediately they have information to improve their track forecast. So these are the ways that we're gonna help you. Fires as well, volcanic eruptions. It's not just the higher spatial resolution, it's not just the spectral channels, it's not just the temporal refresh, it's all that combined, which is truly gonna be revolutionary. All right, thank you. Yep, yes. We need you to stay, we need you to answer questions. <laughs> yes, so we are gonna do a Q&A now again, so go ahead and raise your hands if you have questions and we'll try and pull some from the internet as well. I'll start over, we got a couple on this side. When will the information uh, and the data collected by Gozar be available for meteorologists around the country to actually include in their in their forecasts and the and the things that you know in, that that impact people on a on a daily basis? Right. Well, we'll do it as soon as we can. So because these, we have a lot of new instruments, we need about six months total to do the on-orbit checkout and the validation of our products that we're going to be making. And uh, we'll start making them available to our science teams for calibration, validation, see if the uh, predicted pre-launch specifications for those products are gonna be met. And then we'll be able to give it to some of the forecasters to evaluate, to help us say, yeah, that product works fine. And then we'll turn on the data stream and then uh, roughly six months after launch or so, even while we're in extended validation, the products will be made available. And I should say we've been working diligently with the broadcast meteorology uh, providers to make sure that the data don't fall on the floor. And I had one of them come up to me at a meeting in Hong Kong with his cell phone showing the Japanese Himawari imager, which is the same, nominally the same as our Gozar uh, instrument with uh, many, uh, Harris made seven of these instruments, four of them for us. And he showed me on his cell phone, he says, hey, look at this thing, isn't that great? I said, does that mean you're gonna get that out to the broadcasters? And <laughs> he said, yes. So. They're very much incentivized to make sure these rapid scan images that you see here get to you. And that's important because you guys are the last mile to the public. So even though we get it to the forecaster, here in the United States in particular, the broadcast community is what's key to get it to the individual so they'll take some action to save themselves if need be. And so by getting you that, getting it on the air, I think people will personalize the potential risk to themselves and that's how we're gonna help people react to these uh, new warnings. Is the uh, resolution on the lightning mapper, is that the same re uh, half kilometer resolution no, or is it, is it better uh, than that? For, there's good reasons why it shouldn't be. Um, uh, for example, when we, the, the pool of light I told you about at the top of the cloud, typically that fills the whole top of the cloud. So the optimizer signal to noise for detecting that you want your pixel on the order of what that pool of light is. Think of it during the daytime, I've got this bright sun shining on the top of the cloud and I want as little of that signal as getting into the instrument, but I want as much of the lightning pool of light to get in. So if we optimize the spatial pixel to that size, which is on the order of four to eight kilometers. So we have an eight kilometer pixel across much of the field of view to optimize that. We also look at a near infrared spectral line where about 10% of the lightning total energy occurs. So we try and get that. And we're coming down where the sun has got its maximum output so we try and minimize the sunlight energy even during the daytime. And then we do this background subtraction I was telling about to try and raise the signal to noise ratio to get the lightning. Yeah. Hello, how quickly would natural disaster emergency planning go into effect, estimated that we now have this rapid gain of information of what, uh, like by tracking hurricanes, uh, doing hurricane watch? tornado watch, how quickly do you think we'll be able to actually 
start to now take effect. With right. So let me start with the tornado one, which I've been working on for 40 years. <laughs> so for that one, um, the Storm Prediction Center, who puts out the watches, so that's the first step. Um, they tell us that first that they wanted this imagery, the rapid scan imagery yesterday. So they love it when we've been demonstrating it to them. And what they're telling us is that about 12 hours out from when the time a severe weather event would happen, they start intently looking at satellite imagery. So they start with the models, then they look at the imagery, and they're looking at changes. So I see these boundaries and things occurring. The models can't predict those. So you need to be able to see those, those features. And so when they see that and they know that, like that line of uh, that outflow boundary that went and hit the clouds that were developing, they know that in two hours it's going to reach that. And if the atmosphere is unstable, something good is going to happen or bad. I guess something interesting is going to happen. And so that gives them some earlier lead time. And what will happen, and has happened actually, so you see a line of storms that's propagating, and they put out warnings like county by county or state by state. So when you get into the next county warning area for a particular weather service office, when they see that this is going to happen, this convergence of boundaries into unstable atmosphere, then they're going to extend their watch. So they use that information of what they're seeing happening in real time to know whether it's a likelihood that, say, in the next two hours or four hours, storms will still continue to be very strong and need to be concerned with them. For the hurricane problem, I think uh, following the track forecast, getting the models more accurate. If the tracks are divergent, you've seen the spaghetti maps where they're all over the place. So hopefully we can converge that, and that will help emergency managers get more confidence, say, three or four days out. Steve, we're going to take a question from social media. All right, this one comes from Twitter. Uh, what potential hazards could you encounter during the mission? Could the spacecraft encounter ah. during the mission? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll turn that one back over to uh, to, to who? <laughs> to, to Ed. So, um, well, we know that um, radiation. Um, you know, these particles that penetrate the spacecraft, so that, that could be a potential issue. We're monitoring them, and that fact, that's why we, we collect that information, so that future spacecraft can be hardened against the uh, space environment, which is a nasty environment. So we're worried about radiation, we're worried about the uh, effects from the sun, putting out solar storms, um, those kind of things. So, I mean, you have to live through that. Sometimes you safe the uh, satellite, turn off the instruments if you have to. Um, the solar eclipse is, is something that we do much better with now because it runs down our batteries when we don't get any sun on the satellite uh, solar wings. So um, right now we have a very small outage period, but we do get stray light that can come into the instrument telescopes um, during the eclipse period. So that's something that we're going to be checking out once we're on orbit and see if we can mitigate or minimize some of those effects. We have time for one more question. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Gray Bright. If I was to give you an unlimited amount of cash and remove a whole lot of technical <laughs> complexities, what instruments would you put on your perfect satellite to take us to a stage where weather's no longer a forecast, but more like the closest that we could get to accurate prediction? Oh, boy. <laughs> the big, what do they say? The bigger the boy, the bigger the toy or whatever it is. <laughs> There's, a couple, there's some things that we don't do in the U.S. that are of great interest. One is a scatterometer. It's an active instrument that measures ocean wind speed. Not that you have to have that in geostationary, but we don't even have it in low Earth orbit. Steve Volz was telling you that it's the constellation of observations, you know, all combined together with the models that's important. There is one instrument we were supposed to have on GOES-R, but we, lo we lost it due to risk and cost and everything else called a hyperspectral infrared sounder. Uh, the Europeans and the Chinese are going to fly such an instrument the first time, and we have it's something we're looking at for the next gener generation. What will that do for you? So that, that same storm system I showed you, we don't know what the instability is of the atmosphere there. However, with this infrared uh, hyperspectral instrument with a couple thousand different spectral bands, you can see profiles of the structure of temperature and moisture the atmosphere. So Steve Volz is telling you, well, we do that today, but we do it from low Earth orbit, and we get a snapshot every 12 hours. A lot happens, as you can see, in 12 hours. And so if we could do that, you know, like every five minutes, you could do a small area scene and get the temperature and moisture profile at five or 10 kilometer 
resolution, which is the objective, then we can see storms going into unstable environment. You know they're going to go and grow. They go into a stable environment, they're going to collapse and die. So that'd be very valuable information, and whether or not we're able to afford it in the next generation architecture, you know, I don't know, but that would be in my, uh, in my uh, Christmas stocking, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Our next speaker is going to talk a little about the Gozar spacecraft itself. Let me introduce uh, Calvin Craig with Lockheed Martin. Thanks, John. All right, are we on? Um, apparently. All right, so um, our job at Lockheed Martin um, is to take all these wonderful requirements and these wonderful instruments that everybody's been talking about and actually build a spacecraft bus that can support the capabilities that they've requested. Um, if I could have my first slide, please, I'd appreciate it. Um, so I'm sure you guys have, have uh, been out, seen the rocket, seen that big fairing on top with the, uh, what looks to be very voluminous inside. Well, what's filling that volume inside is what you see in front of you here on this slide, which is the, the satellite that has all those instruments on it. Um, it. As we got these requirements in the beginning of the program, um, we realized that we were going to have to pull from our cadre of many different vehicles that we had built prior to this and come up with some new technologies in order to accomplish this mission. So um, we pulled from our A2100 commercial series of satellites that uh, flies at geosynchronous orbit uh, all the time. We pulled from our interplanetary line of satellites that um, flies to other planets and has to be very autonomous and protect themselves against some of these dangers that people were asking about earlier. Um, just to comment on that real quickly, uh, we have about 30 30,000 pieces of telemetry on board the vehicle that tells us what's going on with the vehicle and fully half of them are dedicated to actually protecting against failures or faults that could occur on the vehicle so that it can autonomously recover even if a ground station isn't there. And then we also drew from a number of different um, satellites that we've built that have very stable observational platforms like an ICONO satellite or a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter satellite that we've built that actually allow us to point very accurately and um, keep those images at that high resolution without blurriness in the pixels. So if we can go to the next, uh, next slide. Um, this is a different view of the uh, satellite here with the actual solar wing deployed. It gives you kind of an idea of the scale of the satellite. Um, it, fully loaded, it is about 5,200 kilograms. Um, about half of that, give or take, is fuel, so it's about 2,800 kilograms of actual satellite with about 2,400 kilograms of fuel on board. Um, and so that, uh, the, sat the solar array that you see here is about 250 square feet or so of um, solar array cells. That puts out about six kilowatts of uh, power, which is enough to power about five average uh, U.S. households, if you will. Um, satellite, as you can see, is somewhere around 20 feet tall or so. The two instru the instruments are on the very top of the satellite here that point towards the, um, towards the Earth. And then there's also the solar pointing instruments, which haven't been talked about a lot here. Um, but the, the two solar pointing instruments are on a, a platform in there that um, basically can tilt and point those instruments straight at the sun. Um, so this is about as, as close to an in-flight picture as you can get on the ground. Obviously, uh, with the limitations of deploying things on the ground with gravitational effects and those types of things, we can't build them to support their own weight in a lot of cases on the ground. So we have to, have to kind of support things, uh, as you can see, the rails on top of the solar array. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, and in this next slide, this will kind of be in, uh, just a, an in-flight view, if you will. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the capabilities of the satellite and the simultaneous uh, requirements or the simultaneous nature of some of these requirements. Um, those instruments that are pointing at the planet, basically we have to point those within a few arc seconds of a certain point on the ground. And you say, okay, well, what the heck's an arc second? So if I just compare that to something that you might understand, the, um, if you were to throw a dart at a dartboard and try to hit a bullseye, you would be hitting a bullseye from about a quarter mile away. That's how accurately we have to point this spacecraft. So we're whipping around at about 3,500 miles an hour basically to stay at a stationary point. It looks stationary from the Earth, but we're whipping around at about 3,500 miles an hour and trying to keep that thing pointed that accurately. At the same time, we're also rotating the solar array, trying to keep it on the sun, and rotating those solar pointing instruments so that they're pointed at the sun with exactly the same amount of accuracy. So now I've got my two hands pointing in different directions, rotating as the spacecraft's going around in its orbit. Um, in addition to that, uh, geostationary geo satellites make great communication satellites. So as you've heard, 
not only do we downlink the raw data, but we also take other data back up and then basically take that package data and send it down to all those meteorological users we were talking about before. Um, we have, and then let's not even talk about things like, for instance, the, the buoys that are at sea that detect tsunamis, those types of things. They have to communicate somewhere. Where do they communicate? They communicate with the Gozar satellite. Um, we also have search and rescue band on this. Uh, about 250 people a year are rescued um, via this search and rescue band where they basically have beacons as they get lost at sea or wherever, um, and they're able to be located because of the search and rescue band that we have on board the vehicle. The long boom that you see is a magnetometer. That's part of our, our, our uh, I'll say, space weather instruments, if you will, that's measuring the magnetic field, um, along with the particle counters that you heard earlier. You can't really, there's a small cabinet on the bottom that you can see there that has some of the, the particle counters that count the, uh, the uh, charged particles as we go through the orbit. Um, so let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, this, is, this is a picture of the satellite as it was getting ready to go into its thermal vacuum testing uh, which is basically a test where we, we subject the satellite to very cold and very warm temperatures for that matter um, to make sure that it, that it survives those temperatures, make sure that our thermal protection system works the way that it's supposed to work, make sure the heaters turn on and off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in order to do this, we have to flood those walls of that chamber with liquid nitrogen that's running at about 321 degrees below zero um, in order to get that chamber cold enough to simulate those cold conditions. Uh, we pump so much liquid nitrogen into there that it, it boils off constantly. We literally have to semi-truck a trailer full of, of liquid nitrogen every day in to just basically keep that chamber cold enough to simulate that space environment that we're trying to simulate. Um, that's just one of our environmental tests. We have a number of other ones that do vibration testing and those types of things to make sure it survives our launch vehicle environments. Um, if you look at the load that the satellite actually has to, has to carry on its, its axial direction, basically straight up and down from the, uh, from the rocket, um, it's somewhere around a tractor trailer, a fully loaded tractor trailer's worth of weight on top of that satellite. Um, so it's, it's particularly light and rigid um, in order to support that type of a load. Um, so I think if we go on to the last slide here, this is basically just a, a precursor to say, we're doing these in parallel almost. Um, the the GOES-S vehicle, uh, which is on the right in the picture here, the GOES-R vehicle is on the left. Um, that GOES-S vehicle will be launching in February of 2018. So we see you guys back here in a year and a half. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, and that'll be launching in February 2018. And then we have another one, GOES-T, that goes up in 2019. And then GOES-U fully fills out the fleet um, after a pretty long storage period in somewhere around 2024. So those are the, the launch dates of the satellites that are coming up. Um, so a lot of activity going on, and so that's trying to uh, summarize literally millions and millions of work hours that go into designing, testing, and building the satellite in five minutes. So um, questions? <laughs> questions. I have one actually for you, Calvin. So sure. I don't understand all four spacecraft are, are, very, are very similar or Correct. identical. Yeah. But you said goes you launches way down the road. Is there any possibility if a new technology came along you could augment the, the spacecraft? Um, certainly there are possibilities. There are no plans at the moment. Um, but certainly, you know, if NOAA came to us with new instruments or something like that and said, hey, we, wanna, we want to absorb the, the uh, extra cost and or schedule to go do such a thing, um, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. Gotcha. All right, not seeing any questions. Um, thanks, Calvin. Appreciate right. you being here. Awesome. Thank you. And just a reminder for those watching at home, please uh, use the hashtag AskGoes if you have a question for any of our panelists. Um, to get you a little excited about tomorrow's launch and um, mission, we have a short video for you. Let's roll it. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas Systems Propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur Systems Propulsion. Go. Range Coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch Director. LD is go and permission to launch. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Three, two, one, and liftoff. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Our uh, next two speakers are here to talk a little bit about the launch itself. Uh, we have uh, Mark, Mark Weiss with um, NASA's Launch Services Program and Amuka, Amanda Cooker with um, United Launch Lines. Mark, Amanda. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So, so who's been at Kennedy before? Is this first time for some of you, or is this a lot of you been here before? So how many first time? Yeah, so pretty cool, right? So just watching that video every time gets me excited. So launch service program, been around at Kennedy since 1998. Um, obviously, NASA has been launching rockets for a long time. Before that, and I've been putting satellites in orbit for a long time. Before that, each satellite organization would focus on getting their ride towards the end of their processing. And obviously, you know, a lot of work goes into what you see on these GOES satellites. You know, they probably 15 years of trying to get that right, and then they have to go find a launch vehicle. So in 98, they consolidated all that rocket engineering expertise across the agency and brought it here to Kennedy. So we're lucky we get to live here at America's premier spaceport, the 21st century launch complex. That's, you know, history of launching the shuttle and you know, human access to space and, and a great future for us as well. So LSP goes out and, and works with these spacecraft customers once they start getting ready to, to figure out how to get to space. So we've got a, a great team of engineers and analysts back here that, that will work through all the iterations of what's the right size of rocket they need, what's the, you know, how do we mitigate the loads and the environments that that spacecraft might see on its way uphill to make sure it gets there safe and it, it gets there in good shape. So for GOES, for the, the R launch that we're going to do tomorrow, we went out back in 2011 and started working to procure a launch service for NOAA and NASA. We bought both GOES R and GOES S's launch vehicle back in 2012, contracted with United Launch Alliance, who Amanda's here to represent, and found that right balance between the past performance of the rocket, the cost, and how we wanted to make sure we got this to orbit. And then for the next five years or so, we've been working the integration and, and working real close with the spacecraft project to make sure you know, all the, every step along the way to mechanically integrate that spacecraft electrically, making sure we keep it at the right temperature when the spacecraft gets here, get them a processing facility, make sure everything's choreographed just right to get them out to the launch pad and get them ready. And then along with that, we're working close hand in hand with our partners with United Launch Alliance to, to make sure the rocket's ready, make sure we understand all the changes they're doing as they upgrade this rocket and get it ready to launch. So we're proud to be part of this NOAA NASA partnership. You know, we've launched the, the L&M satellite back in early 2000, 2001. Um, we've helped when, when GOES went out and launched NO and P later in the year, and now we're here for this next generation, which is, which is really neat. Yeah, so I'll let Amanda kind of give you a little overview of the rocket and then open it up for questions. Thank you. So I'm Amanda Cooker with United Launch Alliance, and we are America's ride to space. We are the nation's premier launch provider with our L Atlas V and Delta IV launch vehicle families. And the launch tomorrow is going to be launching on an Atlas V rocket. So I'm going to show you guys a little bit what that rocket looks like, if I could get my chart up here. Awesome. So these are the different components of the Atlas V rocket. And tomorrow we're going to be launching a 541 configuration. So what that means is we're going to have our five meter payload fairings. That's the larger of our payload fairings and then four solid rocket boosters. So those solid rocket boosters will attach on to our core booster and really give us a little bit of extra lift off the launch pad, a little extra oomph. And this, this rocket's gonna have about two and a quarter million pounds of thrust coming off the launch pad. So the different components you can see here on the screen, uh, we start with our RD-180 engine, which powers the first stage booster. And the booster is kind of that copper colored piece you can see there. And that booster contains two separate liquid cryogenic fuel tanks so we have liquid oxygen and liquid RP1, which combine to create the thrust for the first stage. So in between our first stage and our second stage, we have our interstage adapters, which connect those two separate components. And our second stage is called the Centaur. And it's one of the most efficient, mass-efficient vehicles in the world. It's pretty amazing. The structure of the Centaur is just about the thickness of a soda can, if you can think of how thin that is. But it's a huge structure and it's so efficient so that we can carry as much payload mass to orbit as possible and keep the mass of our launch vehicle down so we can provide capability so we can have more science instruments put up into space. So then we have our payload fairing like we talked about and the purpose of the payload fairing is to protect the Centaur vehicle and the satellite through launch because the whole purpose of this entire huge 200 foot rocket is to get that satellite into space. So we need a lot of power <laughs> it takes a lot to get, you know, it looks really small when you see it on a screen like that, but you saw the size of the spacecraft when they talked about it before. So it's pretty incredible to be a part of the team that gets to build this rocket and launch it, and we're really excited about the launch tomorrow. Thank you. We probably have time for one question, maybe two. Uh, 
Sorry, we also have a mission profile video to show real quick, if that's OK. <laughs> Let's go. I forgot about that. Let's go. Let's watch it. So this will just take you through the entire process of the launch. Mission profile details the important events of this mission using approximate times. Five, four, three, two. We have ignition and liftoff. The Atlas V RD-180 main engine and four solid rocket boosters ignite to generate the two and a quarter million pounds of thrust to lift the rocket away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins its initial pitch, yaw, and roll maneuvers to attain the proper ascent profile and minimize aerodynamic loads. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 35 seconds. At 46 seconds, the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure. The first two solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, are jettisoned at 1 minute 50 seconds, followed a second and a half later by the third and fourth SRBs. The payload fairing is jettisoned at 3 and a half minutes. As it approaches booster engine cutoff, the Atlas V is burning propellant at the rate of 1,856 pounds per second, traveling at over 12,440 miles per hour, and located 92 miles in altitude and 276 miles downrange. Booster engine cutoff occurs four minutes, 21 seconds after liftoff. Six seconds later, the booster stage is jettisoned. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 5% of what it did at liftoff four and one half minutes earlier. The first Centaur main engine start takes place 10 seconds after booster separation. Cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs just over 12 minutes after launch. The mission now enters a nearly 10 minute coast phase. At 22 minutes, the Centaur main engine is restarted. This burn will last five and a half minutes. Following the second Centaur main engine cutoff at 27 minutes 35 seconds, the mission now enters a three hour coast phase. At three hours 27 and a half minutes after liftoff, the Centaur is started for a third and final burn. A minute and a half later, final cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs. At just under three hours 32 minutes, Centaur releases the GOES R satellite for NOAA and NASA. Hi, um, this could have been uh, for any, anyone, but I'll put you on the spot. Maybe. All right. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of puzzle pieces to make this happen. I mean, ULA and Lockheed and goes uh, and, and NASA, and NOAA, and then here at Kennedy. How, how does that work, and, and what, what challenges or difficulties are there to work with so many um, organizations or other entities to, to make this happen? So I think it's really just about all of the teams really working together to get it done, us knowing what, what we need to provide to our customers, what, what they need from us. And I think all of, all of the people that work together work together very well just to make sure that you know, we all want the same thing. We all want this thing up in space working, providing these capabilities to everyone. So we all have our little piece of that, little chunk of that that we're responsible for doing. And we're all responsible to each other to make that happen so that we can provide this. So it's really just all about mission success for us at ULA. And mission success means making our customers happy and de delivering the satellite to orbit. So. And we have a focus process where we put together a mission integration team that there, there's a whole template series of meetings that we do with ULA, with GOES. We document a whole interface control document and work through that meticulously for a couple of years to make sure everything's choreographed to go the way we want it to go and then always be ready for you know all the little hiccups that come along the way because it is rocket science not easy <laughs> amanda mark thank you for being here appreciate it go goes thank you thank you our next speaker is Ram, rami eliason uh, with the um going to talk a little bit about ground systems here there you go rami Thank you very much. I think for everyone who has been on the Space Coast, we all have a pretty good appreciation of how incredible it is to see a launch. And we understand what the rocket is, and we understand what the spacecraft is. My job here today is to give you a little insight in understanding what a ground system is. And you're going to say, Rami, isn't every system that's on the ground, isn't that a ground system? Well, yes and no. Uh, if you go to the first chart, please. 
uh, let me start by what the job of the ground system is. Uh, first and foremost, as Calvin was talking about all of the uh, telemetry and the commanding and the signals that are going through that spacecraft, uh, there's instructions that are sent to that to make that happen. And that's sent by the, by the ground system. We actually fly the spacecraft. So as we speak, we've got engineers that are going up to Suitland on uh, the operations facility. They're sitting down next to side by side with the NOAA operators. And over the next three to four weeks, they're going to be working with Lockheed Martin engineers and the NOAA operators to make sure that that spacecraft gets to the orbit that it needs to be in to provide uh, the data that we're depending on it to do. Uh, the other thing it's doing is it's commanding all of the instruments, uh, making sure that they're good to go. Uh, they turn on. They're providing all of the calibration and validation that Steve uh, referred to. And then we're going to go about the business of processing the data. And that's, if you will, the secret sauce of this particular bird. Uh, if you look at the uh, instrument panel over there, uh, we've heard a lot about that. There are actually four instruments that are not facing the Earth. Uh, that are facing into space, uh, they're, they're going to take some extremely important measurements. Uh, all of those solar uh, uh, coronal mass ejections, the solar fluxes, all of those things are really, really important to our communication systems, our navigation systems, all those things that we take for granted because we want them and we want them available all the time. Because of those uh, uh, those anomalies that can happen in space, it's really important that we get that information to the engineers, or I should say the scientists and the researchers out of the Space Weather Environmental Prediction Center out in Boulder, Colorado. We actually have to do that within two seconds. Imagine that, within two seconds of that instrument taking that measurement. Uh, that's pretty incredible. If you think about the time that it takes you to take a selfie, upload it, and uh, post it on a Facebook, think about that. So uh, those are the four uh, sensors that are facing space. And of course, we talked a lot today about the two sensors that are facing the, the Earth and observing the Earth. If you go to the next chart, obviously, if you start looking at the advanced baseline imagery and all of the uh, parameters that Mike talked about, you've got three times the content by having all those spectral bands. You've got four times the resolution and it's coming at us five times faster. So when the engineers at Harris Corporation started studying how they were gonna handle this payload and the data back in the early 2000s, they really had to create a way that they could break that data up instantaneously when it first hits the ground system and comes into that, that all of those computers that are processing it and they are processing it. Okay, ready for this? 40 trillion operations per second. Think about that. In order to produce that data and get that out in the order of seconds, uh, that's the kind of processing speed that you have to have. So if you go to the next chart. Uh, so what we have captured for you here today, uh, and unfortunately it's not going to be looping. We actually have these visualizations on a looping feed. Uh, this is actually from the Himawari bird. And what you start to see is the contrast that you're going to get amongst the different layers of the atmosphere and how that's going to start playing into the numerical weather prediction models. Okay, next chart. Somebody was asking earlier, if you keep going, they were asking about climate and will it help you with climate? Uh, the answer is, is absolutely. The more information you have, the more knowledge you're going to acquire, and then we're going to be able to put that in the hands of researchers. One of the important facets of this ground system is to make it very, very easy to go from research to operations and operations to research. And that's so that the numerical weather prediction can continually improve so that broadcast meteorologists can actually absolutely bring better content and data to the viewers. If you keep going, this is a dust storm, and you see the pinks in there, that's the dust separated by all the cloud layers, very, very important. Uh, this is looking at the typhoon that hit Fiji earlier this year. Uh, again, the resolution, and this is actually compressed content because we put it onto a PowerPoint slide. But when you're looking at it looping in real time and that processing speed that I talked about within the ground segment, you hear a lot of people saying that it's like going from stills to a looping real-time video, and that's absolutely the case. 
Um, the advanced baseline imager, is that, that's taken a five minute full scan of the whole Western Hemisphere within 30 seconds, all right? Within 30 seconds of that instrument starting to make those measurements, we're starting to push that data out to the National Weather Service so that they can start using that. So it's a continuous feed of that. And you, you need that real time information in order to make those informed decisions. Is so if you continue, you have a few more that do get you into more of the climate. Here's environmental monitoring, looking at the quality of reefs. I've been a scuba diver over 35 years. Uh, I can tell you that things are changing below the water. Uh, and this allows you to, to again, look at that, uh, understand what's happening to the environment. Uh, if you go to the next, uh, next slide, uh, here's one off the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, and you can actually see some of the discharges having to do with pollution. So a very powerful instrument, but the power in that is the data and put into the, the right hands, and that's what the ground system is intended to do. Can I answer anyone's questions? John. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't have a question. I was saying anything when the audience had one. Oh, there we go. So you said that after 30 seconds, the NWS will be able to see it. Will this also go down to other partners um, within 30 seconds, say like other broadcasters, um, private companies? Very, very good question. Uh, one of the important functions uh, that uh, I should have spent a little bit more time on on the ground system, uh, when, when the signals are first coming down uh, to Wallops, Virginia, uh, they are actually going to be uh, processed, and a couple of things are going to happen. They're going to register where it is that it's occurring on Earth, right? You see this weather, where is that happening? Where is that atmospheric anomalies happening? So you register it, then you, you do the calibration of all the instruments, then we actually push it back up, if you will, uh, to the satellite for the GOZAR rebroadcast. That signal will be transmitted from the spacecraft across the whole Western Hemisphere. Uh, that will allow you to get that content and that information on the order of, of seconds, again, near real time. All right, this is coming from social media via Twitter. Will Gozar have downlinks that the public will be able to receive at home like older satellites? I won't be able to receive it at home. It's not, uh, it's not your uh, dad's GVAR, uh, which is the current link that, uh, that is there today. So be because of the signal level, the, the, the amount of data coming down, you're really going to have to upgrade that direct readout terminal. Uh, there's a number of vendors that do provide those direct readouts, uh, in including ourselves. Uh, but uh, very, very important that we get that information and content to all of the users across the whole Western Hemisphere so that they can protect lives and property. But no, you won't be able to get that at home, uh, but you will have to upgrade that terminal. That's a good question. Rami, I think that's all the time we have. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rami. So we've talked a lot about the launch, uh, but as we've kind of hinted at, there is life for Gozar after tomorrow. So to kind of talk about the users of Gozar, I'm going to invite Joe Pika from National Weather Service, Brian Mata from National Weather Service, and uh, Bob Rutledge, who's from the Space Weather Prediction Center, to talk about using Gozar data. So Joe, you want to kick us off? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, we at the National Weather Service are very excited about uh, the NOAA GOES-R satellite getting up into orbit and being able to use that. And so let us uh, talk a little bit about some pro products that we're going to see, maybe that uh, you might not necessarily uh, consider uh, at, at first glance. So we've, uh, you probably heard, uh, three times as many spectral bands, four times the resolution, five times the update rate. So what does that mean uh, for some of our products? So first slide, please. So one of the things we did as part of the proving ground, and this is one of the things I, I try to give credit to the NOAA GOES-R program for organizing with the weather services, we took advantage of other instruments that are out there. In this case, uh, the Japanese satellite Himawari. And basically what you're seeing is uh, atmospheric motion vectors. So these are cloud-derived, water vapor-derived uh, motion vectors. And we're basically seeing how, how dense they're going to be Gozar is going to make these very dense um, all across the, the Western Hemisphere where we have GOES right now. And we're able to use these to inform uh, aviation weather, so situational awareness of where the winds are in the atmosphere. Um, so that's, that's the right now aspect. 
But then we're also going to be able to feed this into our numerical weather prediction models to improve those, those short-term forecasts of severe weather where tropical cyclones are going to be going. So this is one of those, those key ways in which we're going to be able to use this. For me, I'm a former ship captain. So right now we're looking at uh, uh, the North Pacific, and that's one of those areas where we don't have a lot of radio sounds or other observations that tell you the structure of the atmosphere. So being able to see these atmospheric motion vectors is very key to what's the weather going to be like on the ocean, and the ocean prediction is one of our, one of our roles as well. So let me go to another, another aspect. Um, so next slide, and there's, uh, there's actually a movie. So one of the things we do, again, for aviation weather, is we track volcanic ash. So this is one of the, the, the very first eruption that was seen by that Himawari satellite. This is on the Russian Kamchatka Peninsula. And so in the center, center of the screen, you can see the plume of volcanic ash coming up. And so this is a bad day for any aircraft that are flying in that area. And so we try and get the word out, and we're going to be able to do this so much faster with GOES-R than we've ever been able to do. So here's a couple of, of, of examples on the ways that GOES-R is going to make a difference. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Brian? Thanks, Joe. Okay, I'm Brian Mata with the National Weather Service. Uh, if we could take the first animation. Uh, we have a group of meteorologists called National Aviation Meteorologists that work with the FAA uh, National Command Center in Virginia. And what this is showing you is a, a satellite animation in the area of Chicago. And you can see over the Great Lakes there, there's uh, orange and red colors. Those are indicative of uh, instrument flight rules, or IFR, and the conditions causing that are fog and low stratus. And so in this particular event, the uh, Weather Service, National Weather Service, worked with the FAA to reconfigure the air traffic so that the planes in the air could land safely, and um, they didn't have to divert to other airports, essentially saving on the order of $600,000 for this particular event. This was in the early morning hours uh, in the Chicago area. So uh, that's one example of the, where the sort of the rubber meets the road and the cost savings can really be demonstrated uh, in this one particular instance. Um, we also have another um, example here, uh, animation, and Steve was talking uh, about severe storms, and here's a case in Oklahoma where this initial storm uh, begins to develop but then stops and this next storm develops and actually does produce a tornado. So the uh, meteorologists will get actually earlier indications before storms actually appear on radar of whether a given storm is uh, developing enough, rapidly enough and strongly enough to produce uh, severe weather. So uh, with those two examples, I'll stop and we'll go to Bob. Thank you, Brian. So we've talked lightning, we've talked clouds. Now I get to do the space stuff, which you can't see or feel or touch, which is always challenging for me. But uh, it's already been highlighted that the, the GOES R series continues the long history of providing the observations of the sun that really form the basis of the forecast that my forecasters make. As it was said, they stare at those two second values all day long, every day, 24 7, 365. Uh, you know, the sun is always, activity is always possible. And not only does it form the basis of our forecast, but it really forms the basis of any space weather forecast, product, or service really worldwide. Uh, so this data is exceedingly important, and it's not duplicated elsewhere. It's probably easiest to talk through what happens on the sun and how we use this data. So, so solar activity is really any changes on the sun that affect technology or, or affect the near-Earth environment. And uh, that generally comes from large eruptions from sunspots or active regions. So we watch those. Uh, the enhanced imagery will help us better characterize those, better forecast what's likely to happen. And then once things start to happen, the, the measurements of the X-ray radiance from the sun that we get in uh, every two seconds will help us understand when we start to see that eruption. That's really the, f the first key uh, that something is happening. So that's fed into models that describe the high frequency impacts on the daylight side of the Earth, for example. So if you're flying from LA to Hawaii, you could have an aircraft that's impacted. It also does a great job of characterizing the radiation that can change, not only for the satellite's health itself, but also for other satellites in geostationary orbit, as well as 
aviation radiation exposures, communications outages near the poles for different reasons, um, and, and just changes overall to, to that environment. Uh, the last piece, the one that uh, has a, a lot of attention worldwide, is, is the geomagnetic storm piece. So the same phenomena that drives the aurora can also cause risk to long conductors on the ground, which would be the bulk power system, um, and, and that can be a serious, serious risk if, if in the extreme event. So the, the observations characterizing those active regions, watching those eruptions really is that first step in saying that something is possible and something big could happen uh, in the near term. And many observations go into that, but certainly GOES has a key uh, role to play. So this is great continuity for us, and we're looking forward to the data um, better in every way, as you've heard, and uh, thank you very much for your time. I think we have time for a couple questions with this, uh, these three panelists here. Uh, they'll all come up to the stage. Uh, this is your last uh, group of panelists, so if you have some burning goes question you want to ask, especially on the subjects they just mentioned, now's your chance. So the idea of GOES being able to help with space weather and, and solar out outbursts and things like that, is it at an altitude that's actually uh, uh, effective for, I mean, if you, can, if you can spot it, but if the space weather is actually happening at that altitude of 22,000 miles, isn't, isn't it just too close by that point to, to do much? So, so there really are two categories. So when, it, when the sun erupts, when the, the light and radio waves makes it to Earth, we're measuring it at Earth. So that's, that's very good information to know, though, and that's how we characterize the whole globe. So that's kind of an in, in situ measurement, same with the radiation. It's what's happening right near you. And then taking the pictures of the sun, really, you can do that remotely from, you know, from afar. So it's very, very good at that, and it's a nice, stable place to get that with very, very few eclipse periods. So it kind of depends what you're measuring, but it is, it's well suited uh, for really many of the applications we need. All right, this next one comes from Twitter. Uh, will Gozar be able to measure the wind speeds of hurricanes? So as I showed with the, the Himawari, we're actually going to be able to show atmospheric motion vectors. So we will be able to do that uh, in, in storms using that. So it's basically cloud motion derived, water vapor derived, um, at, le at least at the, the top areas of the storm. Okay, not seeing any more questions. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate you joining us today. Well, that wraps up our program. Uh, as a reminder, launch tomorrow is at 5.42 p.m. Eastern time. Launch coverage starts at 4.45 p.m. Eastern. You can watch that live online on, at www.nasa.gov slash NASA TV. If you want to follow the mission online on Twitter, you can go to at NOAA Satellites or at NASA. And the hashtag is GOZAR. Go GOES.